welcome to the third day of the workshop that's going to be dedicated to cognitive science. It's my great pleasure to introduce Gualtiero Piccinini, who is professor at the University of Missouri in St. Louis, and who has published extensively on many of the topics that have been touched upon in these days, uh, especially computation, mechanistic, the mechanistic framework in cognitive science and in biology, and he has recently developed his own, uh, or relatively recently developed his own uh, theory of, of computational implementation, the mechanistic view, uh, and uh, he has uh, defended it in detail uh, in a book published last year. He has also worked on information processing, its relationships to computation. So let's, uh, let's hear about natural mental representation today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the introduction, thank you. Uh, Orly and Nir for inviting me to this wonderful workshop in this wonderful place that I, that I love so much and I've been here several times. Um, always happy to come back. Um, so this is a contribution to uh, the project of uh, explaining and naturalizing intentionality, which for those who don't work in philosophy of mind uh, is one of the holy grails of the philosophy of mind. Um, one, one thing that's puzzling about the mind is that we have the ability to represent things or to talk about things. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go into explaining why that seems mysterious, but it does seem somewhat mysterious and people have devoted a lot of time to um, trying to explain that. Um, of course, it also connects with the project of may, uh, accounting for the notion of mental representation that uh, cognitive scientists, cognitive neuroscientists use, uh, but this is a little bit more specialized. Um, so it starts with the phenomenon of intentionality. Um, and uh, there, the, so as I said, there is a uh, standing project of explaining an intentionality in non-semantic, non-intentional terms. Um, and I am going to argue that the, the kind of um, account that's been most successful so far is still insufficient because um, uh, what it's good at is explaining what I'm going to call natural representation, um, but there is an important distinction between natural representation and what I'm going to call non-natural representation. And so after trying to argue that the standard account of representation does not work for non-natural representation, I will briefly sketch uh, what I think is a promising, hopefully a promising way to um, give an account of non-natural representation. Um, this distinction between natural and non-natural is uh, derived from Grice. So Paul Grice had a uh, distinction between natural meaning and non-natural meaning. I'm just, I'm basically borrowing those terms and um, applying them to a representation, um, meaning approximately the same thing that the Grice meant, and I'll tell you what it is in a second. And um, it should not be uh, taken to imply that non-natural, that there's something non-natural about non-natural representation in the sense that it doesn't fit within the natural world or it's not explainable scientifically or cannot be explained in non-semantic terms, okay? So although I'm using the word non-natural, it doesn't have certain kinds of connotations that the term sometimes has. I'm just using it because that's what, that's the, the terminology that Grice introduced. Okay, so this is the plan. Um, uh, so the first step it involves uh, introducing natural representation and the standard story about it, uh, if you already know it. Uh, great, you can you know sleep for the next ten minutes. If not, um, I'll tell you when you have to wake up. And uh, it, you know if you've never heard this, it will be very quick. But it's, it helps to understand what comes next. Um, so you know here are a couple of examples. Uh, I look in a certain direction. I see Oran Shagrir, or he talks uh, in the background. So I hear his voice. Um, those are examples of <coughs> natural representations uh, and what that means uh, to begin with is that the entail that Oran Shagri is there. If everything goes right, a natural representation entails that its object, the, the content of the representation, 
uh, is the way the representation says it is, uh, represents it to be. Um, and if, if that's not the case, so if, if I'm representing Oran there and he's not there, um, one, one thing that many people are inclined to say is that the, there's a malfunction in my representational system or the representation itself is malfunctioning. Um, it's supposed to represent Iran there only when he's there. If he's not there, it's malfunctioning. Okay, so of course there are cases like that. There's hallucinations where we, re we uh, represent things being there even though they're not. Um, and a, what I consider to be the most successful attempt at explaining natural representation begins with the notion of natural information. Um, so natural information that P entails that P um, or in a probabilistic account of natural information, it raises the probability that P. Um, and what this natural information is, is something having to do with um, reliable correlations or causes or laws linking the state itself that represents and the, and the thing or the state that is being represented. So, um, you know, yesterday we were talking about mutual information, mutual information is a measure of a correlation between two variables uh, in the communication context is the source and the receiver. So in this case, um, I, pref I prefer to think of it in terms of the source and the receiver. The source is neuron, the receiver is my per perceptual state, and the perceptual, if the perceptual state correlates with the source well enough, in, 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 the, in the one case, in the specific case where it represents Oran, because that's the, the the content of that representation, that's what that particular state correlates with, um, we might say it carries natural information. Um, so this is a notion of semantic information um, and it corresponds to Grice's notion of natural meaning. So Grice um, used the term natural meaning and his example was <laughs> those spots carry natural meaning or have the natural meaning that she has measles and I'm just using the information language instead of meaning language, um, okay? So this is the ingredient in an account, one, one, the main ingredient. And um, the, the main representative of this kind of account is Fred Dretzky. Um, so his account is that uh, you, can, you start with something that carries natural information in this sense, and you add to this the function of carrying this information. So it has to have a, a biological function, if you will, or some kind of teleological function to carry this information, if the state has this function and carries the information, then it represents um, what it carries the information about. Um, I think you know there are there, there's a whole family of accounts uh, broadly of this forms. Not everybody talks about natural information in this sense, but I think that. Um, the, they have the same problems that I'm going to discuss with respect to non-natural information. So I think these accounts are very good. They're good at accounting for natural re representation. Um, they're not going to work for non-natural representation. I'll tell you why in a second. Um, and I think there's plenty of natural representations in this sense in our brains, in our minds. Um, you know, a lot of neurophysiology of uh, perceptual states involves um, finding reliable correlations between states of the brain and states of the environment. Um, so you, you might say that those states of the brain carry natural information about the states of the environment and um, there's evidence that that's the function they have. They, they carry this information not because uh, of some freak accident, it's because uh, that's the function they have within the nervous system that the information they carry will be used by the system to guide action eventually. Um, and this gives us an account of representational malfunction. So uh, according to this kind of account, um, if a, the state of a variable um, misrepresents something, um, the, what, what happens is that it has this function to carry natural, natural information uh, about the state of the world, but it fails to do so, um, or in a probabilistic formulation, it's simply that um, the variable is in the state that would normally represent a certain state of the world, but the world is not that way, okay? 
So it, this is kind of an important test of an account of representation that it gives an account of misrepresentation. Um, all right, so I, I mentioned functions. Uh, so what are functions? The different people have different accounts of function. I have an account of function that I think works well uh, for our purposes and many other purposes. I just put on this slide. Um, the, 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 very briefly, a function, as I uh, think of it, is a uh, stable contribution to a goal of an organisms, in this case, by one of their traits, the state, you know, a state of their brain, okay? So it's a contribution to uh, a goal. The goal could be simply survival and reproduction in the, or survival and inclusive fitness in a, uh, in a biological context, obviously, for human beings. You know, we have all kinds of other goals. You know, there's plenty to say about this. I, uh, I'm not going to get into it. Just, to, just this is just a flag that um, I have something to say about functions. What functions are? Other people have different views. That's fine. Um, okay, so now we're getting to non-natural representation. Um, here's an example of what I have in mind. Um, I imagine that I'm dead. Um, my mental representation is about me, but it doesn't entail that I'm dead. In fact. If I were dead, I couldn't represent this at all. I couldn't imagine it. Um, so it does not carry the natural information that I'm dead. And you know, the first question I want to ask is, is, this, is my representational system malfunctioning? Is there a malfunction there? We'll get back to this. Um, there are lots and lots of examples of uh, types of representations, representational states, and and of course, representational processes using those representations that um, that do not entail that what they represent is the case. Uh, this is obviously not news to anyone, but I think that philosophers have not done justice to this phenomenon in their accounts of representation. And um, and by the way, um, you know this is a work in progress. Um, I could be wrong, of course. Uh, I would welcome your objections or concerns about my account. So, you know, this is why I'm here. I'm here to hear what you have to say about this. Um, so let's get to it. Um, so this is an example. Um, one thing that you might try to do to give an account of this, paralleling, you know, it, it, analogously to the way Dretzky gives an account of natural representation, you might say, well, we might introduce uh, and use the notion of non-natural information, which is something that I have done, actually. So, um, so this might be a tempting strategy. Okay, so let's just, let's assume for the sake of the argument that there is this phenomenon of non-natural representation, that meaning a representation that doesn't entail that things are the way they're represented, and uh, and so it requires a different kind of account. Um, well, it might be very similar. We might just say, oh, there's this non-natural type of information. And um, we might try to use that as an ingredient. Um, so again, non-natural information is approximately the, approximately the same as what Grice called non-natural meaning. Um, it, and, and, and so it's important that non-natural information, that P, does not entail that P, uh, and may not raise the probability that P if you have a probabilistic account of information. And the Grice's example is, those three rings on the bell of the bus um, non-naturally mean, and I'm saying instead carry on natural information, that the bus is full. And that's just because there's a convention that that's what they mean or that's what they carry on natural information about. Um, well, the bus may or may not be full. I mean, that's what, they're, uh, that's what they represent. If, if you want to think of it as a representation, this is what they carry on natural information about. But, um, you know, a bus driver might have forgotten to turn off this, the sign or, you know, he might be pulling a prank on us, uh, whatever. Okay, so um, there's no law of nature or, 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 or reliable uh, fact about uh, these, these variables such that the, the state of the uh, bell of the bus has to come with a certain state inside the bus, okay? So the reason I introduced, you know, and uh, Andrea Scarantino and I introduced this notion is because I, we think it's a, it's, it captures a certain usage of the term information in both everyday life and in science. Um, but what I'm gonna say is that we can't use it 
to give an account parallel to the kind of account of, na of, uh, of natural representation that I, that I just uh, reviewed uh, a minute ago. And the reason is that if you tried, I mean, this is what you end up. You get that, you know, that you, this, this state, you know, this internal state, A is P, not naturally represents that something is the case, B is Q, just in case, you know, it carries the non-natural information and it is the, its function to carry this non-natural information. So this, this is exactly parallel to Dretzky's account of natural representation. Um, and a pro one problem with this um, attempt um, is that this is not really a naturalistic account because we haven't been told what uh, non-natural information is in any sort of naturalistic way, but there's another, maybe even more significant problem, which is that we don't have an account of misrepresentation. Uh, so, what, and the reason is that whether whether uh, non-naturally misrepresenting is a malfunction is independent on whether a, a, a signal or, or a state carries the non-natural information it is its function to carry. I will defend this in a second. So here is an example of what I'm getting at. Um, and this is the first kind of the first part of the example. So I imagine being dead, uh, and I really believe it. And there are some uh, psychiatric or neurological conditions where people believe they're dead, they, and they seriously say they're dead, and they don't believe you if you tell them they're, they're alive. Um, so I mean, it's rare, but it can happen. Um, so these people, they are fully intending to represent things as they are. Um, in that case, my thought, you know, you might say, carries the non-natural information that I'm dead, and that seems to be its function. At least I'm, that's what I intended to, to do, to represent things as they are. Um, in fact, in that case, it would even seem to be its function to carry the natural information that I'm dead. Um, but it does, mis it does misrepresent it. So there seems to be some, something going wrong, um, there's, which you might say it's a malfunction. Uh, so, so far, you know, you might say, OK, so that's promising. It, it, the, the Dretzkian kind of strategy seems to work for explaining misrepresentation. Um, and you might say, well, then what is non-natural misrepresentation? Um, and you could say, you might say a, a, that if, if, if uh, my state is the way it is, you know, my state is P is in a certain state, you know, my, my, my say my neural system is in state P, um, it not naturally misrepresents that something is the case, you know, in this case that I'm dead, just in case it's its function to carry the non-natural information that I'm dead, but it fails to carry the natural information that I'm dead. Okay, so it's this is you know it, it appeals to non natural information as a function, but then it says it's, it also fails to carry this natural information. Um, I'm not saying this is an elegant account. It's just to uh, to motivate why this sort of strategy doesn't work in this case, um, because it although in this particular example the way I framed it. It seems to work. It did not be the case that I'm misrepresenting anything. Um, so this is the second part of the example. I'm still imagining that I'm dead, but now I know I'm alive. I don't have this condition where I can, I'm convinced that I'm dead. I'm, I'm intentionally representing myself as dead um, for my own reasons. that have nothing to do with representing myself accurately. Okay, so maybe I think it has some kind of mystical value and. It helps me become a better person, or it helps me accept death whenever it comes. You know, it doesn't matter why. But I, I'm, I'm fully aware that I'm alive. I just am intentionally misrepresenting my own state. Um, so it, you know, my state, that my thought, my uh, the state of my imagination does not carry the natural information that I'm dead. Nor is that its function. Uh, it does carry the non-natural information that I'm dead, and that does seem to be its function. Um, it rep is misrepresents that I'm dead, and that's what it's supposed to do. It's not a malfunction. Um, it would be a malfunction if it failed to represent, to misrepresent that I'm dead. Okay. Okay. So the point again is that 
whether uh, a non-natural representation misrepresents may or may not be a malfunction. So the, the standard account based on malfunction doesn't work. Okay. Um, the, there's a lot, as I said, there are a lot of examples of this sort of uh, representational state, and I, had, I just listed them at the bottom of the slide. Fantasies, pretense, dreams, hypothetical thinking, counterfactual thinking, myths and fairy tales, fiction. They're all situations where we represent things differently than they are, at least in part. I mean, you know, of course, uh, some of this might be accurate. Some of the way we represent the world might be accurate when we engage in fantasies or in fiction, but plenty are not. Um, and yet, it's not a malfunction. It's, there's nothing going wrong when we do fiction and we misrepresent things, let's say, for example. So. How are we going to account for that? And so now, the, now this is kind of the beginning of the positive part of the paper where I'm going to try to uh, sketch an account of non-natural representation, including non-natural misrepresentation. And uh, I'm not saying this is fully worked out, um, but it seems to me that this would be a promising way to think about it. So uh, my first assumption is gonna, I'm making is that um, cognitive systems like us uh, maintain internal models of the agent and its environment uh, and use those to guide action. So this is the way I uh, think uh, about representation. I'm certainly not the first person to say this. Uh, this idea goes back at least to Kenneth Craig. There are a lot of philosophers and cognitive scientists who have uh, defended a version of this idea uh, in recent years. Um, predictive coding slash Bayesian models uh, could be seen as a specific version of this account where they emphasize prediction as the, the, the main driver of these models uh, while, uh, you know, in sensory input is used to minimize the prediction error. Uh, I'm, not, I, I'm not wanting to commit myself to that specific version of this account. I think that uh, Certainly, our internal models ca cannot be based solely on prediction, but they also cannot be based solely on, um, on receiving sensor information from the environment and using that to build the models because the environment, um, can, the variables in the environment that we try to model are not always fully uh, perceivable. Uh, so we also need some degree of filling in or prediction um, to to have functioning models. Uh, the exact you know the exact proportion of uh, prediction and, uh, and and sensor information uh, I think doesn't make a big difference for my purposes. So, uh, but the but the the the, the paradigmatic kind of model is a model that is constructed and maintained online in real time in resp with respect to the way the agent and the environment are uh, at this time. So they're a paradigmatic example of natural representation. This is how I think about natural representation. Um, the first observation is that these models uh, go beyond sensory information. So if you're Bayesian, you say, well, there's prediction going on. There's lots of prediction. That's even the main thing. Um, even if you're not a Bayesian, you, might, you will still have to agree that uh, you go beyond, your nervous system goes beyond the sensory information in maintaining models of itself in the environment, or your, yourself in the environment. So here are some examples. Uh, you, you keep track of objects and places whether or not they're perceived. So um, you don't suddenly stop being able to represent uh, the rest of the building just because you're inside the room. Um, if somebody goes outside and you see them go outside, at least for a time, your nervous system or your internal model uh, is perfectly able to imagine them that they're now they're going out the door. You don't even see the door, but you know there's a door around that little uh, piece of the wall, okay? Um, you keep track of, uh, of past events, 
so you have memory. Um, you extrapolate future states of yourself in the environment. Um, so that's, that's very helpful in uh, figuring out how to act. You know, you go down the stairs and you anticipate where the next step is going to be. And if you, if you suddenly uh, think the, the, the stairs is over, but there's one more step, you, you, know, you almost uh, lose your balance because you were anticipating things being a certain way, but they turn out to be different. Um, you may infer unobservable causes. And all of these, though, are still extensions of natural representation. It's still, you, you, it's still fair to say that this is natural representation. You're still trying to represent things exactly as they are um, by using some combination of, let's just say, sensory information and prediction. Um, But there's an important additional power that internal models have you know, for sufficiently sophisticated um, cognizers that they can run offline. And it doesn't take that much to, um, to have a model that runs offline. You know, all you have to do is just uh, start planning actions uh, beyond uh, the immediate um, response to the immediate environment the way it is. Okay, so when you when you're just expecting the steps of the stairs to be there, you're just you're just responding to the environment in real time the way it is. But sometimes we and and other animals, other cognitive creatures, um, we anticipate you know what would happen if we do a certain thing. You know, if you, if we perform a certain action, how would the environment respond? How would other agents respond? And then how would we respond to that? We're not necessarily able to do many iterations of this, but we can do a few. And, um, uh, and you know, and you can get better at this, you know, chess players or um, other, other um, anybody who is engaged in a, in a specialized activity involving interaction with others uh, will uh, develop strategies for anticipating responses and responses to responses and responses to responses to responses. Um, in which case, basically, we're running our model, if, if it's chess playing, our model of the game, uh, based on the current state of the game, we're running it offline uh, for a few moves, right? So we can do this offline simulation. The offline simulation, I'd like to point out, um, comes in kinds and degrees. There's lots of different ways that we can do these offline simulations. Um, it can be more or less extended in space and time. Uh, so we can represent things that are very proximal, like just around the wall. Um, but we can also represent other parts of the building a little farther away. We can represent where the building is, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the campus or in the, in the city. We can represent relative to the hotel. We can represent, you know, we can keep going. We can represent Jerusalem relative to the rest of Israel. Um, in this case, you know, we might rely on the knowledge of maps because we didn't really experience um, all the relations that we might be representing at this point, um, unless you know we've flew, we've flown over Israel many times and we've seen where Jerusalem is relative to other parts of Israel, and we represent Israel relative to the Middle East, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the Earth relative to the solar system. Um, so this this is a you know different uh, spatial scales. The same thing for for time. Um, there is also a degree of coordination with online modeling. Uh, so you know if you're um, if you're, say, imagining the, the way a chess game evolves, you are still anchoring it in the current state of the, of the game, in the current state of the, of the pieces on the board. Um, sometimes, though, you just imagine things that are completely disconnected from um, anything uh, in the environment. Uh, you know, you could have more or fewer operations involved in the manipulating these models. Uh, you can have different degrees of interaction between the sensory Im imagination and the motor of imagination. Sometimes you're just imagining things happening. Sometimes you imagine yourself in involved in those um, imagined situations. Um, it, sometimes you're doing it more automatically. You're just kind of daydreaming. Sometimes you're doing it um, deliberately, as in a, a, when you're uh, trying to decide what to do in your chess game. You know, you're deliberately trying to figure out what the best move is. So there's lots of things. There's lots of things going on with respect to 
um, offline simulation or off, uh, offline running of these internal models that gives us resources to deal with different sorts of situations. Um, but one thing that is common in all of these cases is that uh, the organism should track in some way, not, not consciously, um, or, I mean, if it's unconsciously, it's fine. It's just that, that you know, a lot of times it won't be conscious. You track the degree to which you are departing from the state of the world. Uh, so if you are, you know, imagine your next, uh, uh, you're trying to figure out what to do with your um, chess game. Um, you should keep track of when, when you're imagining a move and when the move is actually happening. Uh, because if not, if you're just going to start thinking that all the things you're imagining are actually happening, you'll make the wrong move. You'll respond to a future state of the board instead of the current state of the board. So uh, actually a, future, a possible future state of the board, um, which hasn't occurred yet and at this point it won't. Um, so it's important to somehow keep track of the distinction between the, things, the way things are and the way we are representing them in this offline simulation. So presumably there's some kind, something, some internal state, not necessarily an explicit uh, signal, but it could be just this, the way that things are occurring and the way they're manipulated that keeps track of this. This tracking might be thought of as a form of natural representation. So what, by whatever means we track the the degree to which our simulations are offline or are, are um, uh, representing things differently than they are, that would be a form of um, natural representation. It's supposed, you know, it's a tracking relation. Um, so at this point, the, the question I, I'm going to ask is, how do these offline simulations get their content? Okay, they, they're not... Uh, they're not correlating directly with the way things are. So by, this, by the account that I gave, you know, the Dretzkian account, um, malrepresentations get their content based on what they, they reliably correlate with. Uh, but in this case, these, these states do not reliably correlate with the way things are. So how do they get their content? They get it, I, uh, I suspect, at least that I'm inclined to say, from, um, from the online simulations themselves, uh, in the sense that they are reusing representational resources that originate through online simulation. In the case, let's say, of the chess game, you are still uh, somehow manipulating internal states that, when you're representing the board as it is, correlate with the state of the board or the state of the pieces on the board, but now you're just uh, internally manipulating them in a way that does not correspond to the way the board is. So why is it that, you know, the queen in your simulation, uh, of course, I'm in, I'm, I am individuating this by what it represents. How does it get to represent the queen uh, on the board? Because it's, it's basically the same sort of internal model that you use to represent the queen on the board itself the way it is. You're just using it. Um, you're just using it represented in a different state. Um, so, so the content of offline simulations piggybacks on the content of online simulations in this sense. Um, there's, there's a lot to think about, about the operations that are performed on uh, representations in, in the context of offline simulations and how content might have to uh, be inherited by representations that are the result of these operations and I haven't really spent a lot of time thinking about that um, I just I just flag that there is plenty to think there there's there's plenty to think about there about how content is inherited um, so my my proposal is that offline simulations represent non-naturally uh, they do have the function to represent things differently than they are to some extent um, in, in many cases. Okay, so many of them. Okay, many of them have the fu this function of representing things differently than they are, which is the hallmark of non-natural representation. 
And when the organism keeps track of this, um, these offline simulations fulfill their representational function, which may include misrep misrepresentation, meaning representing things differently than they are. So in my example, I know I'm alive, but I imagine being dead. That's an example of this. I, I'm, I'm basically simulating myself uh, in decoupled from the way I am. I am aware of doing that. I'm, I'm tracking this. Uh, so it's the function of this is state of my imagination to represent things differently than they are. Namely to not naturally represent in this case. Or not naturally misrepresent. And that's, but that's the way it's supposed to be. Um, but on the other hand, sometimes we do fail track, keep, to keep track of this. And offline simulations, you might say, malfunction. So, you know. Where uh, many of us, maybe most of us, are diluted at least some of the time. Uh, this is a very common phenomenon. Um, and I'm inclined to say that's a malfunction, uh, typically with people. Uh, and we could talk about that. But um, you know, at least in the, uh, in the, in the standard case. Now, uh, to get to full-blown intentionality, we do need one more ingredient. And that is at least the intentionality of language. Um, and that is arbitrary representation, uh, having an arbitrary representational system. So, so far I've just talked about internal models of things, um, but at some point, we know, at least we human beings, we acquire a, um, a language uh, or another s system of symbols. And, um, and of course, you know, the w words in the language or systems of symbols, they can have an arbitrary relation to objects and properties. I am not going to get involved into you know, explaining how that comes about, um, but, but it happens. And so you can arbitrarily assign words to objects and properties and relations. Um, you know, a simple example is the vervid monkey alarm calls that were mentioned on the first day. Um, this by itself is not enough to give you non-natural representation because um, you could set up this arbitrary symbolic system and still have it functioning so that the only way you use it or the only way it's supposed to, to be used and, or to function is that um, it's supposed to represent the way things are. And anytime you're wrong, it's a malfunction. So I don't really know about vermin monkeys, but it might be that um, the way they use these alarm calls and the way they're supposed to use them is solely to represent things as they are, to represent which kind of predator is present or not present. Um, this is still a an, an kind of natural representation. And I'm not a, making claims about verbal monkeys, it's just an example, somewhat imaginary in my case, because I don't know enough about it. Um, but if you combine this with offline simulations, then you get arbitrary non-natural representation. Um, so you have an arbitrary representational system where you know, the symbols are arbitrarily related to uh, objects and properties, and you run offline simulations involving those, um, then you can you know, in either intentionally represent things correctly using them. So you know, of course, I can still say you know, the, the water uh, is in front of me, or Ron Greer is to my left. And, and the function of that is to represent things as they are. That's totally fine. Um, and, you know, the function of, of these representations is to represent things correctly. But I can also intentionally misrepresent. And so you know, people lie and deceive each other all the time. Um, but, the, but the function of that is precisely to misrepresent things. Um, so this is the last slide. Uh, I think non-natural representation Non-natural misrepresentation is, di is not a kind of representational malfunction. Nevertheless, um, non-natural representation and misrepresentation can be explained in terms of these three things. Natural representation, which is the kind of stuff that Dretzky explained, plus offline simulation, plus tracking the degree to which a simulation is offline, plus for full-blown you know, linguistic intentionality, an arbitrary representational system. Now, th again, I, I'm going to reiterate that this is very sketchy, um, and there might be something wrong with it that I haven't thought about yet. So I hope that you help me figure that out. Um, 
But so far, I, I hope this is um, a promising way to think about an unnatural representation. Thanks. Are you going to keep track of the questions? Yeah, I, I yeah. see a lot of hands. So yeah, let's, I see lots of hands, so let's try to keep it short with the questions. So, ah, right, so uh, let's take the microphone. So uh, let's start with Rosa then. Okay. So, so it sounded to me like you were um, pointing out something like the distinction between content and some creature's attitude towards that content, um, where it's like the difference between having a belief that P and a desire that P, and the, satis the attitude is what fixes the satisfaction conditions. Um, I was wondering if you, that's the way you've been thinking about it. Um, I haven't thought as much about uh, desires. Um, that obviously is another important aspect of representation that needs to be considered. I am just, um, I've just been thinking about the kind of paradigmatic case where we were just representing things being a certain way. So, you know, either belief or an analog of belief, which is not uh, necessarily intended or his function is not necessarily to represent things the way they are right now. Um, but yeah, so there are other attitudes too, and they definitely need to be included in that kind of representation. Great, Fred? Yeah. Um, I, I love the talk. Thanks. And you probably know why. <laughs> I, I, I love the talk, you probably know why. Um, I can guess. I'm a Dretzky and through and through. So let me ask you quickly, first a Dretzky question and then a, and then a problem case for you. Yeah. So the, the Dresky question is, uh, why is it malfunctioning when you represent yourself as being dead? Because you have a concept of yourself whose function is to represent you, and you have a concept of being dead whose function is to represent dead things. So although you have a false belief, I don't see why it's a malfunction. Um, It's a, it's a malfunction if the function of the representation is to represent things the way they are. But, it, but, but it, the function is to represent kinds of things. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, let's set that aside. Now here's the one that I think w is more interesting for you to think about. In your offline simulation gets content from online simulation, then you'll, you'll have problems with uh, vacuous kind terms, vacuous names, things like that. So that's my that's my more s specific question. Yeah. So that's what you know. I, in one slide, I had this last line saying, "Oh, there's lots to think about involving abstraction or composition and um, um, you know operations we can perform." Uh, so that this is this is the this is the kind of case that involves that, that's, it's that sort of situation where we, we can manipulate these offline simulations in various ways. And, um, and depending on what operation we perform, there's still the kind of representational content, um, but it cannot directly piggyback on an online simulation. So I think, um, you know, perhaps empty names or empty um, representations of individuals are uh, have the this, this sort of structure, this, this sort of representational structure, the way they function in the system is exactly the same as the representations of real individuals. Um, so in that regard, we can assign them this representational role based on the, the way they function in the system, but there is no object there, so um, we, you know, we can't say they represent the individual, but we can say they represent this hypothetical individual, and it, depending on what they assign to that individual, we can also give them some sort of content. Um, so, but it's a more, it's certainly more indirect. And you can see why it's a problem on a naturalist uh, Gricean account of, of natural meaning. <laughs> yeah. So next is Ron. Yeah, so I think my question kind of follows up on, on the same set of issues, but I'll ask, I'll ask a slightly 
different version of it now. So I mean, you talk about reuse of representational resources, and I understand that that might be motivated by a particular kind of, you know, uh, ideas from neuroscience about co-option and reuse. But I'm just curious why, I mean, how, how big a role do you want that to play? I mean, it seems on the face of it, it's like, why should reuse of that vehicle actually matter all that much? It seems like it's more the functional role, uh, and it may well be that there's just some kind of systematic relationship between kind of states that are generated by online cognition and then states that function in memory or in a kind of, you know, pretense box or something like this uh, for, for counterfactual reasoning, whatever. So, I mean, I'm just curious if you, if you think the kind of reuse bit is doing real work here or it's just the fact that that would be a special case of there being some kind of systematic relation between states that get their meaning through, you know, causal interaction with the environment and states that kind of get used in these various forms of offline cognition. Yeah, thanks. Um, that's an excellent question. Um, you're right that I do have at least a somewhat vague and sketchy uh, way of thinking about this that involves uh, a kind of neurocognitive architecture. It's, it's you know, I'm not thinking about this, uh, uh, I'm not trying, I'm not even trying to think about this solely in terms of the problem of what is a representation and how does it get its content, which is closer to the traditional way of doing this in, in the philosophy of mind, you know, kind of an abstraction from issues of cognitive architecture. So, yeah, part of this project involves, um, involves merging an account of mental representation with an account of neurocognitive architecture mm -hmm. and, and you know, under the suspicion that um, that you can't really give an adequate account of mental representation uh, without considering the way the brain works. Um, but yes, that being said, you know, if the brain worked very differently than the way I think, then we might have to go in the way that you suggest. Mm -hmm. Uri, Uri. Um, yeah, so I wanted to ask you about um, this is more, more about clarification. So the non-natural representation is a kind of representational state that doesn't um, imply what it represents and it doesn't raise the probability of what it represents. And, and hence you want to say it doesn't carry natural information, what, what yeah. it represents. Um, but that seems very, so do you think that that is a kind, a type of representational state that hasn't been thought about yet. At some, in some places it, it seems that that's what you wanted to suggest um, um, because you seem to distinguish it from Christ's non-natural meaning but it seemed very very akin to it. Of course it's a different question whether you, 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 know, you align yourself with Christ's account of that phenomenon mm -hmm. um, and that's quite different but you know someone like Millikan for instance would would totally agree with you. Yeah, yeah, there are these representational states that don't carry natural information, and I have the account for it. Absolutely. So no, I didn't mean to suggest that people haven't thought about this before. Um, uh, so I, I, I am casting this problem in a certain way and in a certain language that is at least partially my own. Um, and I explained how, where it comes from. So yes, so the natural natural distinction is taken directly from Christ. Um, Christ was thinking more about, I think, the, the meaning of public symbols, symbolic systems, like language or signs on the bell of the bus. Um, Millikan definitely does have an account of uh, this sort of stuff, and I think, um, it suffers from some of the difficulties that uh, I attributed to the Dretzkin account insofar as we are dealing with non-natural representation, but um, it would be a valuable exercise to go back and look at what she says again and, and reconstruct exactly the relation between the two. I, I haven't done that, but they would be, that would be worthwhile, so I'll make a note to myself. I haven't, I haven't read Milligan in a while, so um, 
So uh, the gentleman over there. I wanted to know if the uh, three bells on the bus, is that a real, a representational situation, or is that your non-representational idea of, for instance, response to wishful thinking? Can you say that again? Please? Okay, the, the three bells on the yeah. bus mm -hmm. uh, as an example of uh, natural representation, or is that your non-natural representation, your wishful thinking? Mm -hmm. Does that really exist? Is, I've ridden buses here in many countries. I've never encountered that. Three bells on a bus to say that the bus is full. Yeah, well, so I think it's three lines on the, um, on the front of the bus. The, the, this, this may have been the, they may have been a, a something they used in the UK in the 50s. The, yeah, do you, do you know anything about that? I was very young back then. <laughs> You know, but related to that, I, I wanted to ask you if you're aware of a paper that was presented here at a brain scanning conference at the end of February at Hadassah Medical Center that may have documented, according to the researcher, what we call wishful thinking. In other words, nerves firing, yeah. but not at a high enough level to actually do a function that the brain is asked to do, but the nerves are never latent. They're always firing and getting ready to do something. or wishful thinking or something else that you mentioned, a fancy or something like that. Are you aware of that? No, it was a PET scan. But I'd, I'd love to get the reference. I'll send you the paper. I'll come up afterwards. Thank you. And, okay. Thank you. So Mark? Thanks. Thank you. So my question is actually related to Rosas and, and Ulrichs. So, and I guess, I'm not sure it's a clarificatory question. So, um, so you presented the, the paper as um, contrasting natural and non-natural representation, but and, and appealing to Grice, and at, at least to me that was kind of, you know, according to Grice, these are two different kinds of representation. So one can be false, the other cannot be false, and there are a bunch of, you know, um, of properties. But it seems that what you were presenting at the very end is that the distinction between natural and non-natural uses of representation. So the idea is that you don't have two kinds of you know, you have a representation, it's just that you can use it in different ways. Sometimes there are certain mechanisms that, like natural mechanisms, what they do is to fix the content of the representation. And once they are fixed, then you have other mechanisms that can use this representation for other purposes, right? So I, I thought that was, you know, a different way of putting the things that I think, um, you know, it's, it's less, um, I mean, it's, it's clear for, for me. And, and if you put it that way, then, um, for instance, it's, it's unclear what the, what's the role of this modeling part. You don't need, you know, it's just that you, ca you, you can just have one representation and the idea that you can have mechanisms that use that representation offline for certain purposes, but you don't need anything more complex than that, anything kind of structural representations or anything like that. Um, yeah, that was the... Yeah, I, see, I think I see where you're coming from. Um, and there, and, and in my point, it, some limitations of this distinction between natural and unnatural representation, but I, I would not want to say that they're just simply representations that can be used in a natural and unnatural way. That would be a very different kind of distinction. Because um, when I say non-natural representation and when Grice says non-natural meaning, um, we, we, we don't want to imply that um, that these always misrepresent, or that they're, they're uses in which the, rep, the, the, the world is misrepresented. It's just that, um, it's just that it, it, it may or may not be represented correctly. So that would be um, non-natural representation, or non-natural meaning in, in you know, Grice's terminology. Um, whereas natural meaning is the kind of meaning, or natural representation, Entails, Guy says entails that things are that way. I, I'm, I don't think I want to be that strict. You know, I might just have to raise the probability. Um, so it, it's really a distinction between uh, two kinds of representation. It, but, it, there, but there may be the need for more distinctions or maybe for a continuum. I don't know. Yeah. So we have five minutes for five questions. So let's try to, let's try to make it. Aaron? Thanks. Um, 
I'm slightly puzzled about choosing Grice at a workshop with all these disciplines concerned with information because his distinction is just a tiny fragment of what we know about the history of con discussions about meaning, content, communication, planning, thinking. For example, uh, it doesn't say anything about the sense reference, Zen, Bedeutung, connotation, denotation, family of distinctions, which I think would be crucial for some of the cases you discussed. It doesn't say anything about compositionality. You have things that can represent, that can be put together to represent something else. It doesn't say anything about disjunction or negation, which when used with compositionality can raise all, all the problems you mentioned, uh, but they are not problems if you see that the use of disjunction and, disjunction and negation are useful information processing mechanisms. It doesn't say anything about um, the difference between stating propositions that might be true or false, and using information as the content of an intention, of a question, of a proposal, of an instruction, and instructions suggest stuff about biology and genomes and so on. So what my suggestion is that if we want to get a deep theory that links up philosophical ideas about representation, semantics, and so on, with all the other disciplines, we should perhaps not start from Grice, but make use of a whole lot of other stuff in Frege and many more, uh, uh, Tarski, and all the work that's been going on in the last 50 years in artificial intelligence, linguistics, and so on, should all be part of that. And it's, I just wondered whether you had a principal reason for focusing on Grice. Thanks. I, I hope you didn't, you didn't expect me to deal with all those issues in, in one talk. Um, but um, yeah, so I agree with everything you said, except the bit with the bit about maybe we shouldn't start with Grice. So you, uh, for, you know, for, for what I was trying to do, I, uh, this is a useful distinction. And, and the reason I am starting here is that, um, that there's this important uh, project that people started in trying to account of natural representation, at least meaning representing things as they are or representing a state of the world as opposed to giving an instruction or, or forming a desire. Um, and then there's actually literature on the content of those things too. Um, yeah, so this, you know, potentially this is a, at least a book like project. Um, I haven't even written the paper yet, so there's plenty to think about, yes. Oh, and I left out modality, impossible. Possible. So uh, we have time for one last quick question by Eva. Yes, I want to highlight something that was said and that is uh, that, the, uh, that the function that you are attributing to, uh, to things is, uh, uh, is not necessarily the function that you are attributing to the actual uh, token. Uh, this is something that you have said. So think about pretend play in children. Say pretend again. play. Pretend play. Pretend play is pretend. It has a very, uh, but, but you, you are not looking at the, at the function of the particular game. Of the, the, the particular belief of the child, you are looking at the function of pretend game as a strategy, and the same is true. And uh, so, this is the, the first point. So, the function is uh, uh, can be at a very different level than the token. This is the first uh, point. The second point is related to the the online uh, on, uh, the the tracking of online and offline things. It is, of course, very important in the case of imagination. But uh, if you're thinking about uh, other strategies, for example, trial and error, uh, learning through trial and error, when there is no imagination involved necessarily, then although the, uh, most of the time an animal is in error, <laughs> it's making a mistake, the strategy is, is highly functional. So again, uh, although in the case of imagination you do need this kind of things, you do not need that. Uh, you, once you sort of allocate the function to the, at the right level of um, uh, uh, to the right level, which is very often so, well, which is sometimes at least not the particular, not the token uh, situation in which the animal is, then I think it can add to to your account. Yes, thank you. So right, we are out of time, unfortunately. So I suppose that uh, the three people that were in, on queue can afterwards perhaps ask Voltaire or something, and uh, that's it.